There we got the recording. Good morning, Evelyn. people. Good. This is the Pastor Larson, and I am asking you to join us in a Bible study, which is uh, which is about Jesus. It is about Jesus. So let's begin, and this is how we begin. As I said, I'm Pastor Larson with Trinity Lutheran Church in Delray Beach, Florida. It is sunny and warm down here. I don't want to rub it in for those of you who are shivering in 30 degree temperatures. It is difficult. Most of us have lived in the north, so we remember, we remember what it is like, and that's all we're going to say about that. I want to invite you to our worship services if you are in the area in person at 8.30 and 10.30. There are 30 or more gathering in person safely, or you can watch the worship and join in your heart at the same time, 8.30 and 10.30 at trinitydelray.org. Here is the Bible study, the Bible study answering the question, who is Jesus? And we'll get started here by this bit of introduction. Who is Jesus? Believe it or not, we've completed our brief look at the miracles of Jesus. We did about two-thirds of them in our study. And these miracles show Jesus to be the Son of God with power. How can we sum them up? How can we sum up the importance of 37 miracles? Well, this time, let's consider how the works of Jesus authenticate his words as well as his commands. The question is, what do you believe about the one you call Savior and Lord? Is he your shepherd? Is he your shepherd today and all of your days? Who is Jesus? Let's think about the miracles Jesus performed. They were done in the Father's name. They were done in the Father's name. That is, he could do nothing without the Father sending him. And he did everything according to his Father's will. The miracles of Jesus also tell a story. They witness to the identity of Jesus. This is he who was proclaimed by the prophets, promised by the prophets. And now he had come in the first century AD in the flesh. And there were many who came to believe in him. And when they believed, they asked the rhetorical question, when the Christ appears, will he do more signs than this man has done? It is not that they expected another Christ. It is a, a question which assumes that there's not going to be anybody else that is going to be able to perform signs and wonders like this. Many will try. Many will come saying, I am the Christ. But they are prevaricators. <laughs> Prevaricator is a word that my mother used when she wanted to accuse me of telling a lie. But that's another story. There was this man, Jesus, uh, had a visitor one night by the name of Nicodemus. He was a secret inquirer. He didn't want anybody to know that he was asking about Jesus. So when he came to Jesus, he said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God. That was quite an admission on his part. For no one can do these signs that you are, uh, that you do, unless God is with him. There is evidence that was seen by those who wondered about him. So there's a bit of a confession there. God is with you. He is implying. A couple other summary statements. Even if you don't believe me, Jesus said, believe the works that you may know and understand that the Father is in me and I am in the Father. There's some mystery in that. There's some mystery in the fact that Jesus is 
really connected anymore. with the Father. And how is that? Well, there are three divine persons, but only one God. So another sentence of Jesus that you're familiar with, I and the Father are one. One God. Jesus' works authenticate him. That needs no explanation. And finally, because of those works, people are drawn to believe in Jesus. And they follow him. Some because they also wanted a miracle. And others because they wondered about him and wanted to see more miracles. Do you have any questions about these concluding statements about his miracles? I just have a question. Um, we're using, or they're using uh, the word sign, uh, works and miracles all interchangeably. Are they all the same? They are the same. Uh, John does not use the word miracle in his gospel. The other three writers, Matthew and Mark and Luke, they all use the word miracle or work. Uh, I should say that John also uses the name, the word work. And it is, as far as I can tell from my studies, uh, they are synonymous. However, when John uses the word sign, it's very obvious to us as we still use the word sign in our day as, uh, as something that points. Hmm. If it doesn't point with an, a literal arrow, it points out something a piece of information that you need to know. It may be red and octagonal and says, stop. That's a sign. But here is a sign that Jesus is the Christ, a sign that points to him. Long answer to your short question. And the answer is yes, they are synonymous as far as mm -hmm. the witness. It just depends on the apostle that's writing the book, I guess, right? Yes, and in John's case, it is a pointer. Um, and as he says in John uh, chapter 20, it's recorded, Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, but these are written. And there's a pointer. Hmm. The, the signs that are in John's gospel, and he has specific miracles that he points to, especially the raising of Lazarus, the, the signs that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you might have life in his name. And I broke up that sentence. These are written that you may know that Jesus is the Christ, and that by believing, there's two different words there, you might have life in his name. So his specific use of the word sign is John's intentionality. This is why I wrote this gospel. Okay. I, I think we'll go on then to some of our summary things. You remember the enemies of Jesus were saying, if you are the Christ, tell us in plain words. So he did, but they didn't believe his words. So he did miracles. Nobody ever spoke the truth like Jesus, for he spoke only the truth when he used plain words. But he authenticated his words by his works. Nobody ever did miracles and signs. I'm combining the two. To make, well, that is... Uh, uh, it's time to pick up his pre prescription. Sorry about that. Okay. Even when confronted with this evidence, many people still polarize themselves against Jesus. But others, by the power of the Holy Spirit, embrace the truth and believe in Jesus Christ. They believe he is Savior and Lord and the one who has come also for them. When I say that our study of Jesus has to do with his person and works. His words are part of his works. I'm not confining the word works to the miracles and signs, 
because when Jesus taught, that was one of the reasons he had come, to reveal the true God. We're going to talk about his person uh, very soon here. Um, can I just ask, you said, this says by others, I don't know if this is out of the Bible, the power of the Holy Spirit embraces the truth and believe in Jesus Christ. Now, this is during this uh, John, right? Did he say that? Because I thought it says somewhere when I read the whole thing that the Holy Spirit was not on the people yet. All right, that's a good question. Um, first of all, this is not a quote from the scriptures. This is kind of my summary of what was happening in the days of Jesus. When they saw the evidence, his words and his works, there were many who refused to believe. They still argued against him. They still tried to trap him and finally crucified him. There were many. But there were others, and I'll answer your second question, who believed. The Gospels re have some witness to people who believed in him. They didn't have complete information about him, but that he be, they believed that he was sent from God, that he was Savior, and that he was, uh, excuse my <clears throat> frog, he was Savior and and he had the attributes of God. Okay. So it was the power of the Holy Spirit, even though the Holy Spirit wasn't fully given until the day of Pentecost, which I think is at the root of your question. There were many in the Old Testament who had yes. the Holy Spirit. Yes. Uh, yes, here and there, but then we kept reading that they took it away. Well, that, that's if they lost their faith. I think Saul, that right? Was, uh, that in the New Testament. Uh, well, Paul, I don't think ever lost the Holy Saul. Spirit. Saul, Saul, like in Sam. Oh, Saul, I'm sorry, didn't yeah. hear you clearly. And yeah. um, uh, David, who sinned grievously, prays yeah. in Psalm 51, take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Yes. So we learned from that that he had not yet lost the faith, and he was praying to God that God would, in spite of his sin, forgive him and bring him, uh, bring him along. Uh, right. Not uh, when when he lost his son, uh, who uh, died in infancy, uh, soon after birth. Yeah. So some with the holy, if anybody believes, whether he's in Genesis or the book of Revelation, if anybody comes to believe any time, uh, let me say before Acts 2, before that time of the Pentecost, anybody who comes to believe it is by the power of the Spirit working through the words and with evidence of the works. Okay. And some came by the power of baptism to believe. It's another long story. You know, when you study theology, you can't, theology is like um, a wheel, and at the hub of the wheel, at the hub of the wheel is Jesus Christ. And all the spokes of the wheel are the, the things that we teach, such as the deity of Christ, and such as the power of God, and the work of the Holy Spirit. Those are the spokes, but the wheel won't work unless you have all the spokes. You can't take anyone out. But the point I'm making now is we can't study all the spokes at the same time. Yeah. It is, it is a complex thing. So we content ourselves to study one at a time. And when one of them touches one of the others, we bring it up briefly. Okay. You know, if that works. And then your questions are always welcome. I'm not going to ever say to you, unless it's really long and complicated. We'll study that um, in um, several months from now. <laughs> That's not very satisfying. Mm -hmm. When I was a student in a class, I always wanted to answer right now. <laughs> Don't make me wait. I'll forget my question. Let's go on. Well, who is Jesus? 
there are some questions I would like you to ponder and if you want to uh, share. Uh, what about the Lord's commands? We haven't talked about his commands, have we? That would be an interesting study. Are we free to pick and choose which commands? No. <laughs> no. Oh, which some of them we, we work very hard at and others we, we neglect or we forget or, oh, that's right, I should be, I should not. You have comments on that? I know your answer was no. All right, if we ask the Lord to speak in plain words, what if he does? Can we then walk away when those words condemn our thoughts and our words and our actions? Your answer is going to be no. So you know that I'm not asking a simple question. What about that? When you read the words of Jesus, I ask you to read the gospels. And every once in a while you run across a command and oh, ouch, that pinches there. It hurts a little. I know that I'm guilty. What's your reaction? <laughs> My reaction would be that I need to read the Bible more. And when you read his command, what then? If it if your if your actions and your attitudes are contrary to Jesus. Change my ways. All right. That's called repentance, isn't it? Yes. All right. So repent and believe that he forgives that and he gives you the power to change. He's not playing games with you when he commands. The simplest and plainest command of Jesus is love one another as I have loved you. And that encompasses it, the entire sum of all his other commands. You see how it does? Because if you love others more than self, you will be busy the rest of your lives. Mm -hmm. And there's always more to do than you have time to do and energy to do and money to do. So you have a limitation. You can't love all 7 billion people of the world. You can love the ones that you know and are close right. to you. Right. And it's a, a lifelong thing. What can I do for you, Lord? What can I do for you and the people that you put in front of me? If the Lord requires us to love our enemies, oh, enemies, and people who make our Christian life difficult, what then? Hmm. Mm -hmm. We know, we know, know that there probably will be sacrifices we have to make um, and endurances we have to uh, handle. And, uh, you know, we may even be and shunned, I guess. Uh, we could even be locked away in prison, I guess, for, for loving our enemies or doing something that uh, goes against them. But as long as we carry out God's word, he's going to protect us regardless of what happens to us. And we know that from Paul, who spent a lot of time in prison. I'm quite sure that none of the people I'm talking to in person right now, that is <laughs> not in person, but in our uh, Zoom. Bible study this morning right. here on the <laughs> Zoom, I'm quite certain that none of you had have spent even a moment in prison or jail because of your faith. And it's probably not likely that it'll happen to you. Um, but there's, a, a, but maybe maybe a better way to put it is that there are persecutions that are happening as we uh, look look around us of people yeah. trying to eliminate um, the Lord in the world, and uh, you know if we, it's our it's our 
job and our love for Christ to stand up for him and to not cowl away or be politically mm -hmm. correct and not speak about him, but to stand up for Christ um, and take, I guess, uh, take, that take that persecution. Right. Uh, I think probably um, the problem I have is with the word that I used, the enemy. That, that, that might be a little strong there. Uh, there are people who disagree with us. Yes, and I would say people of yes. Right. So I, I was thinking that word was a little strong myself um, because sometimes our friends uh, we disagree. As like you just put the word there, not enemies, but you know you you have a, a strong disagreement and right. you want to you want to dislike them or the word hate. And then you realize, wait, hold it. I can't do that. Mm -hmm. you know, I know we always try to keep the political situation out of it, but unfortunately the political situation is kind of um, <laughs> sticking it to Christians a little bit, um, you know, just which what's been happening with some of the lockdowns and the Supreme Court ruling that came down, allowing, you know, Christians to assemble um, in a safe manner, uh, as well as, as they said, strip clubs and bars and that, uh, we were being persecuted in that, in that way. And, you know, I consider, you know, the political system can be an enemy against us in trying to eliminate Christ. Well, Judy, that right. was also for the Jewish people because yes. it was a double thing. It wasn't just. Christian. No, it was for all, it was for all people of all, all faith traditions, yeah. which is the way it came down. Exactly, yes, yes. Right. And so uh, when uh, there, is a, uh, there is a conflict that has always existed in societies uh, in, in various parts of the world over the course of history, and it is this conflict. I'll, I'll summarize it by saying it's the conflict between individual liberty and the public good. Mm -hmm. When the public good requires you to immunize your children at the age of, I don't know how many weeks it is now, and then again with a booster before they go to school and they show up in school, uh, no shot record, no, no evidence, they are sent home. And the reason is, is the diseases that were eliminated during the 20th century by and large by the immunizations. I think I have the decade, I, I don't know what decades it was. The, the law was passed and I don't know, it has been challenged by those who don't believe in immunizations. I won't name the religious groups that refused. And I think in some cases they were given some kind of exemption. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Uh, I don't know the details, but you see, I'm trying to illustrate not to explain those things. The individual liberty to say, I won't comply with that, but that goes against the thing called the public good. And in a free society, such as we still have to a great extent, our public good is sometimes requiring us to wear masks and stay in small groups and not large groups. Mm -hmm. And this is the conflict that is raging now. And I don't think there will be an easy and quick solution. I, I think that most of us are enduring it uh, sometimes not even believing in the requirements, but you know, sometimes <laughs> I learned this in the Air Force. I didn't learn it before the Air Force. It's called go along to get along. And as long as it doesn't compromise my faith, okay, I'll put the mask on. And it's also because I have some Im immune deficiencies and I want to protect myself. Yeah. Judy, you had something. Yeah, I think you're very right in that respect. You know, you have to look at the common good too, and does and does it infringe upon your personal beliefs to that degree? I mean, medicine always looks at that also for the most part, like you just said with the vaccinations. So um, those are things we have to weigh mm -hmm. uh, with dealing. No, and I think sometimes you pray, Lord. I I've got a conflict here between my beliefs and the, and the requirements. And I'm gonna ask you to give me wisdom to, uh, to know when to, 
know when to fold and know when to hold. <laughs> That's a bad explanation, a bad illustration. <laughs> so we have this. Uh, D. Oh, no, it was uh, Chris that started to talk. I know your voice. No. Oh, I'm sorry. I, I should have been on mute. No, I was just listening. That's all. Okay. I, a lot of good answers. Did you know you can raise your hand? There's a thing down here that allows you to raise your hand. I can't find oh. it. <laughs> but yeah, but I, it was, we're a small group. If we had 20, I'd ask you to raise your hand and stay muted. <laughs> but with uh, half a dozen, this is no problem at all. Okay. Well, I wanted you to think about Jesus more than, well, he's God and he's Savior and he saved me and he died for me. But what about the sanctification part of our faith when we try to rule our lives by his word? Who is Jesus? Now, this is a more... Uh, pleasant thing to consider Jesus the Good Shepherd as he calls himself in John chapter 10. He did not pick and choose among the Father's requirements mm -hmm. as he, quote, went about doing good. Are you familiar with that beautiful sentence in Acts 10, 38? Acts 10 is Jesus visiting Cornelius, and he gives the story of, of, God, of God's salvation in Christ. And Cornelius and his family come to believe and they're baptized. It's a beautiful story. It's also for Peter so that he might realize that God wants the Gentiles in his kingdom as well. That's not for the Jews only. Peter had to learn that. But one of the sentences he's, he gives as a, as a witness to Jesus is it's very the shortest sentence that you know about Jesus, he went about doing good. Mm -hmm. And that's his teaching and his miracles, which we've just studied. The good shepherd. And we could study John 10. We did. Yeah. Uh, it's a beautiful chapter for you to read when you're not feeling good. Mm. Uh, okay. The shepherd still cares for his flock. And since we are the sheep, he is called to believe. The Gospels bring us to know him better. We can always get to know Jesus uh, uh, better than we do now. Do you agree with that? Yes. To know Jesus is to be able better to follow him. You cannot follow him if you don't know what he is, who he is, what he's done, and what he wants you to do as you follow him. To follow Jesus is to love him and to love the people that he has sent you to love. Jesus leads and he feeds and he warns and he protects and if you sum up these words that he that just, you say Jesus and then you say a verb, like lead, feed, warn, protect. You can make a long list of what Jesus is for you personally. And all of this fulfills the prophecy. Did you ever think of Psalm 23 as a prophecy? No. No. When, but you realize how quickly it goes because if you read acts if you read john chapter 10 i am the good shepherd yeah. and you remember psalm 23 as you read i am the good shepherd then you realize that this is a prophecy and it tells us something hidden right here in the word lord i say in the 23rd psalm the most beloved psalm of all, that mm. the Lord is my shepherd. And when Jesus says, I am the good shepherd, he is calling himself Lord. I am the shepherd that Psalm 23 talks about. And this is David's psalm, isn't it? David was a shepherd of animals. And he knew what they needed. And what did, David, what did David do for his animals? 
he found green pastures for them to lie down in and he, he brought them where the water was still enough to drink because they would be afraid of rushing, noisy, busy water. Now it leaves the animals here. <laughs> but David speaks more personally. I thought that what we might do is open our mics today if you're muted. <laughs> Um, and uh, read the 23rd Psalm in unison, except there's one problem. There is a delay, you may have noticed, in Zoom. So let's do the best we can Okay. to can read it together. Pastor? Yes? Um, I, I say Psalm 23, it's one of the very few things I've memorized, and, and I say it as a prayer all the time, so I consider it present and not prophecy. I mean, maybe it was there, it's but I consider both. it alive and present. It is both. Oh. It is both because it does speak of the shepherd who would come and do these things and fulfill it, but primarily in the instance when David was saying it, praying it, he was, it is more than that, it is a prayer, and you're, you're right to pray it in the present. I 100% I agree with you. And then it is also something else. <laughs> it's a creed. Mm -hmm. It's a creed. We're going to talk about creeds if we get time this morning. When I say the Lord is, it's like saying, I believe in the Lord, my shepherd, who feeds me and leads me and restores me. And, you know, I'm saying what he is to me, which is a statement of my faith. And that is the definition of creed. So you're correct. And I'm glad that you say it. Uh, let's not save it only for funerals. <laughs> so uh, let's try as good as we, as, as well as we can to read it and almost unison. The Lord, the Lord is, is my, my shepherd. shepherd. I, I shall, shall not want. He make it me, me to lie down. down well, hold on. We have to stop. I just realized the problem with Zoom. It is okay. engineered to have one person at a time. You notice mm -hmm. how it's yellow outlined around the person's when, uh, picture when they're speaking? No. Right. Okay. But only one at a time. Yeah. And I have not learned. Uh, <laughs> we can't do this. Why don't, why don't we each take a verse? All right. Uh, starting with Judy, she's always our lead off. One verse at a time and then someone else. Okay. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. Chris? He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. I'll do the next one because this is the one I love. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the path of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil. My cup runneth over. Lydia? Someone, someone hasn't read? Yes, that's all of us. Surely, good, surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Yeah, thank you. I, I should have known we couldn't read it in unison. Um, I tried this with the pastors a few weeks ago. And I put a psalm up there and asked them to read it responsively. Well, when they came to the response, they, it, it was just garbled because they couldn't all talk at once. Well, they tried. Well, I didn't want to mess up the 23rd psalm. You, you take that. It's going to come to you when I send it to you. But you have it in your Bibles. And, of course, I use the old King James because it's the one that we memorized as children or became familiar with. And it mm -hmm. was at the funerals of so-and-so. And maybe you even have uh, something on the wall that has the King James language. 
I, they, they told us in seminary, there's two things you don't change, the Lord's Prayer <laughs> and the 23rd Psalm. <laughs> All right. Who is Jesus? He is my shepherd. And I know, and go read John chapter 10, that he's going to take care of me. Well, what about dwelling in the house of the Lord forever? Huh? Jesus says to you in plain words, I give you eternal life. You shall never perish. No one will snatch you out of my hand. In fact, no one is able to snatch you out of the Father's hand. You see how strong those promises are? God wants you to be sure that he's got you. I got your back, as we say today. And in the troubled times, listen, we're all in troubled times. It just seems more lately. It's always, there's troubles of, of, of health. There's troubles when someone dies. There's troubles when someone we love is very ill and you don't know there's only a 10 percent chance of those surviving and you pray and then in a couple of weeks you suffer the the loss ouch it hurts that doesn't mean jesus has left you I am um, corresponding now and then in text with, with Frank. And I know, uh, Joanne, you and Frank especially, you're hurting because of, of that loss. A common thing happens to all who dwell on this earth, and that's loss. Even domesticated animals suffer loss mm -hmm. when their loved one dies. Mm -hmm. I'm looking at the clock to see how I should rush along. We have many tangents. I hope they are valuable for you. Who is Jesus? What I'm encouraging you to do is to take one of the Gospels. Mark mm -hmm. is the shortest, but your choice. And read it cover to cover. I'm reading Luke right now. Not a chapter a day. That's too much. I'm reading a little section, uh, the section that has a little subtitle on it. Matthew, and that's, and I, and I try to digest that little part. I'm also reading a psalm, and I'm making my way with great difficulty through Isaiah. That's <laughs> mm -hmm. there's so much I don't understand about Isaiah. But if you read the Gospels, you learn of Jesus. They're plain words, and they're words which Jesus says will never pass away. You got that promise down? Jesus is Savior, Lord, King, Teacher, Alpha, Omega. He's your advocate, your attorney. <laughs> Good Shepherd, Lamb of God, Messiah, Son of Man. Someone has compiled a list of over a hundred titles of Jesus. You can find it on the internet. And many other titles. Each of these reveals something more about this unique person. So I'm saying let's continue. Let's keep going. And we can learn more of what the scriptures teach. What they want us to know and believe about Jesus. Okay. Okay. I almost stopped here. The humanity and deity of Jesus for centuries, not just theologians, but also ordinary people like us, have discussed and studied and read about Jesus, true man and Jesus, true God, and they've tried to figure out this mystery. Well, this is one mystery that's just revealed and not explained. It's, it's revealed and not explained. This teaching is clearly taught in the New Testament. But first, let's pause. And I invite any of your questions about Jesus. Um, Pastor Jim, 
Pastor, I'm finding it fascinating for the prophecy in the Old Testament indicating Jesus. It's fascinating. And, and it's just, uh, to me, it is maybe because I'm first understanding it. It is fascinating. Read uh, 2 Peter chapter 1. And there, Peter says, you know, the prophets, they, they tried to figure out the time and manner of these prophecies. Who is it referring to? And when would it happen? And how would it be? And the, the prophets didn't have their prophecies explained to them. They were God's words. So you read 2 Peter chapter 1, and you're going to find that paragraph in there that uh, is, shows how mysterious it is. You'll find yourself in good company, Chris. Mm. <laughs> I think we're very fortunate to live on this side of the prophecy versus prophecy fulfilled barrier. Right. If you think of the beginning of Matthew chapter one, and the end of Malachi chapter four. I think there's four chapters in Malachi. That there's a dividing line there between prophecy and fulfillment. And as I've told you before, John the Baptist straddles it. Yeah, <laughs> he has one foot in the Old Testament and one foot in the New. And so to some extent, so does Zechariah. Well, I'm saying is that we live on the side of prophecy fulfilled, except his coming again and the resurrection. We're still waiting, yeah. We're in between. Yeah. Any other wonderings and musings and questions about Jesus? I don't know. I, I think this is really a great time to be studying Jesus because of Advent and uh, and the, the Christmas uh, coming up. Uh, right. and, and, you know, we're in anticipation always of Christ's coming. So your study is really paralleling with the uh, with the Christmas season really well. Uh -huh. Anticipation is a great word. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You know, children learn to anticipate and we rob them of something uh, of their joy if we never give them a promise and then fulfill it. Do you see the thing that we do? Uh, it's not just the surprise. That's fun for us, <laughs> but it's, it is also good to say we're going to the circus and then actually go. I've told you that story before when instead of, instead of promising and then fulfilling, we just surprised the kids one Saturday morning with we're going to the circus now, go. Oh. <laughs> instead of having them all week being excited about going to the circus. <laughs> I learned something there. And it's a, and a it's a tiny part of what God does for us. He he puts us in anticipation of our resurrection. Yes. And the resurrection of those who have gone before us, like Frank, is anticipating with hope that he will one day, as as he said to me, First Thessalonians four, is is a comforting passage for him. Mm -hmm. This is what God wants you to know. Any other wonderings or musings or questions? Mm. Fascinating. All right. Well, uh, let's spend about 10 minutes getting into saying, uh, I've never done this before in the middle of our class. Hello, everybody. Uh, but I have something else, and it's blue. All right. How about that? Jesus, true God and true man. Okay. What the word says about the word made flesh. You know that passage. The word was made flesh and dwelt among us. You heard it in the sermon last week. And Judy, you, you're talking about parallels. When he was preaching, I thought, well, that's kind of neat. We're going to do that. Mm -hmm. We're going <laughs> to... 
<laughs> Some of the miracles have even been uh, recounted again that we have shared here in class, so. Right. That's good. There's a reinforcement that goes on. And of course, in a sermon, you get more time to do an application. Have you seen this before? Uh, certainly. <laughs> well, certainly. Yes. I believe in Jesus. And you don't have to wait for Sunday to say it. You can put it in your daily devotion if you want, or just occasionally. And there's no rules. There's no rules for using the creed. But it summarizes what we have been studying, doesn't it? The person right. yeah. and the work. Who is he? Who is he? And what did he do? And what will he do? So you can break it down like this. What we confess, we believe about Jesus. If anybody asks you, what do you believe about Jesus? You can say, well, uh, there's more than a dozen things that I can think of right now. Um, first of all, there's his name, and his name means uh, a Savior. His name means Jehovah saves, or God saves. Mm -hmm. And he is the Christ, uh, the Messiah, the one promised in the Old Testament. I know, I know about Christ, all right, the anointed one. And I know from... I, I believe that Jesus is God's only son, and he is also my Lord. And that has huge uh, connections with the Old Testament, to call Jesus Lord. No one can say Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. Or you can say it, as I often joke. You can teach a parrot to say, Jesus is Lord, but that doesn't make the parrot a believer it is saying he is my Lord who has redeemed. I'm not going to go into that right now. I'm going to use it later. He was conceived by the Holy Spirit. He was born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered for me. He was crucified for me, for my sins. He died. He really died as all men died. Uh, and, uh, and he was buried. Here comes Nicodemus and Joseph of Arimathea, and they put him in the borrowed tomb. Mm -hmm fulfilling a prophecy of Isaiah 53. <laughs> I, I emote because of the love that those two uh, lavished upon the body of Jesus. Yes. And this is a topic we could study from uh -huh. Peter. We did uh, three years ago, maybe four. He rose again from the dead, and we celebrate that. Once a year, we celebrate the resurrection. Right. But you can think about it in between. When someone dies, that because Jesus rose, I too shall rise. And he ascended into heaven, and he sits at the right hand. That's not a place. That's his receiving all the glory that he left when he came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary. Philippians 2. And he's going to come. Oh, great day in the morning when Jesus comes. We can sing the songs. <laughs> he will come to judge the living as well as those who have already died. You know that, don't you? And if someone wants to know who is this Jesus that you people talk about? You've got these in your heart and in your mind, and you know a little bit about some of them, a little bit less about others. You understand? And it's okay to say, I don't know much about that one. Do you have any comments about the creed? This is a study of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Check. I ran pretty much overtime last week. You want to talk about the creed? Yes. Why not? What do you want to talk about? Go ahead, Chris. Ah, you better put it up there again. I don't know it by heart. <laughs> 
Next one. The next one. Next the, the one. whole thing. Really. That blank. <laughs> you mean the previous one when, when before yeah, we uh, before we broke it up into parts? I guess yes. Right. Yeah. Now, what do you wonder? I, I actually don't wonder anything, but uh, uh, I was going to say, I think the statement, you know, for those that might be listening in, he descended into hell is always uh, um, curious. Uh, that, that's stuck in there. Mm -hmm. Three days. Yeah. Yeah. True. Well, if we had time, I'm, we're right at 50 minutes right now. And I, I do want to always keep it under an hour. Um, this is probably going to be a good stopping place. And the next thing, um, let me peek. Okay. <laughs> you can peek with me. Oh, Let's the Apostles' see. Creed. This is fine. We confess in the Apostles' Creed what we believe about Jesus. We also confess what we believe in God the, as God the Father and the Holy Spirit and the work of the Holy Spirit who creates the church through the word. We confess in the Apostles' Creed. This is what I believe in the second article. All right. So the question is, what was the source of these teachings? And that's always a good question. You ought to know, we did this uh, a long time ago. I was teaching a class. I was a vicar in Houston, Texas, and uh, taught the adult Bible class. So one of the things I did was look up Bible verses about each part of the creed. Remember the 15 things I had listed there? I found Bible verses that supported each one of them, sometimes one, sometimes several. So what we did is study the source of the teachings that were in the Bible. Oh, that is fascinating. You can find those yourself using a concordance. Or I think doesn't the small catechism also break it down? If you have a copy of the explanation to the small catechism, which was not Martin Luther, uh, but added over the last few centuries, mm -hmm. those questions are, are broken down into parts and uh, Bible verses for each one of them. That's a good place to look. Thank you. Yeah. So Thanks. during the early three yeah. centuries of the, uh, following the ascension of Jesus Christ into heaven, those who believed had reasons to write down a summary of what they believed. One of the reasons was for worship. A second reason was to counter false doctrine. When it came along and it contradicted with the Apostles' Creed, it was a quick reference to say, no, that's contrary to what I believe. Now, since the Apostles' Creed can be shown very easily to be from the scriptures, the Apostles' Creed was not, I want to make this really clear, it was not a substitute for the Bible. It was a, a personal confession of what I believe the Bible says. Okay. You see the difference? Yes. All right. The content of the faith they confessed came from the scriptures. And eventually, what they believe became written creeds. You can look up a very early Christian doctrine book and practice book, and it's very short. It's called the Didache. I should have it on the screen. I don't. It's D-I-D-A-C-H-E. Didache. C-H-E is pronounced K. It's Greek. The Didache was a summary of, of what they believed, taught, and practiced. I can mm. get it for you sometime. It's on the internet. So my question is, and I think we can stop here, is what is a creed? 
where's my whiteboard? I want to write this on the whiteboard. <laughs> there is a whiteboard in Zoom, but I don't have it available right now. So I'm asking you to just say, tell me what, it, tell the class, what is a creed? Would it be a confession of your belief? Exactly. Do you know where the word creed comes from? No. <laughs> you, you will know. And it comes from the Latin credo, C-R-E-D-O. C-R-E-D-O is Latin and it translates this way, I believe. Yeah. First person singular. And we say, I believe because no one can believe for someone else. You notice we don't say we believe. That's Some have true. translated it that way, but it's the Latin says credo, I believe. Personal <laughs> faith. Questions, comments about the creed? Do you know when it was first recorded? Yes, it's a, it's a third century uh, thing, and it wasn't complete in its first writing. And it's not true that the, the, the 12 sentences were each composed by one of the apostles. Okay. We'll run across that. <laughs> so I'm telling you, it, it can be shown that they didn't do that. All right. Why didn't they put it in the Bible? Do you know that? Well, there are creeds in the Bible already. They're very short. You know what the shortest creed is in the Bible? Jesus is Lord. Oh. And there's another one in 1 Timothy. It could be 2 Timothy. I think it's 1 Timothy. Um, Philippians 2 is believed to be, part of Philippians 2 is believed to be either a short creed or a hymn. Yeah the humility, the humiliation of Jesus. Well, I have to wrap it up because I promise not to go over an hour and we're, we're coming up really close to it. Okay. We, got, we got a lot done today. <laughs> and yeah. it was fun. You did a lot of talking today. I yes. know I did. I, you didn't do a lot of reading. That was what we did at Miracles. It's okay. I've got more. <laughs> but I really appreciate what you are and and, uh, and, and what you do, especially when you ask questions. It's really helpful. Don't be shy, let's pray. Oh Lord, our time is up for now, but we thank you for spending that with us and helping us and hearing our prayer that you might instruct us, increase our faith and our confidence in Jesus as Lord and Savior the one who does still do miracles among us, do them for us and for the ones we love and teach us to love them just as you love them and as you loved us. Your son sacrificed himself, that gift you gave to the world, which we will soon celebrate again. Lord, preserve us, preserve your church, make us close to you, so that if threatened, we do not fear. And if illness comes, we still do not fear because the end of all is that we are with you without hindrance forever. In the name of Jesus, we ask and pray and praise. Amen. Amen. And everybody said, Amen. <laughs>